Okay, it's now six o'clock on Thursday, November 18th, 2021, and I call this meeting of the Bellevue Planning Commission to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Casey? Here. Mr. Hankins? Here. Mr. Ritz? Here. Mr. Arney? Present. Ms. Cutsforth? Present. Mr. Ackley? Here. Mr. Compton? Here. Mr. Perrin? Here. Mr. Jacobson? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. This meeting will be conducted in accordance with the Nebraska Open Meetings Act, a copy of which can be found on the wall at the back of the chamber. At this time, I would entertain a motion to revise or approve the Planning Commission's meeting minutes of the October, what date was that? 28th, 2021 meeting. Motion to approve is written. Motion by Ackley, second by Hankins. All voted yes, motion carried. At this time, I would like to accept into, record, into the record all staff reports, attachments, memos, and handouts regarding each application. Staff, any updates or additions since the packet was mailed? Yes, we have received three additional letters and emails in the last day um, since the packet went out, and those have been provided to the Planning Commission members, um, are also out front for public viewing and will be made part of the public record. Um, we have a letter from Diana Souza, 1702 Franklin Street, in opposition of agenda item 3C. Um, also an email from Carol Shample deasing Again, in opposition from agenda item 3C. And then we have an email with pictures from Jessica Conkey. Um, again, in opposition to item 3C. So I would offer those for the record. I'd entertain a motion to accept into record all staff reports, attachments, memos, and handouts regarding each application. If it pleases the chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept into record all staff reports, attachments, memos, and handouts regarding each application, including the three mentioned tonight. Second. Motion by Jacobson, second by Casey. All voted yes, motion carried. Okay, we are moving to the public hearing section of this meeting. The first item is 3A, a request to rezone lots one and two, Walnut Grove Estates, replat one, being a replat of Lot 2, Walnut Grove Estates from AG to RA for the purpose of single family residential development and small subdivision plat lots 1 and 2, Walnut Grove Estates, replat 1, applicant, applicant Eric Carlson, general location 5007 Platteview Road, case numbers Z2110-18 and S2110-23. Is the applicant here? Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and offer uh, a summary and an up update. Applicant is unable to be here this evening. He sends his regrets due to some extenuating circumstances, was unable to attend tonight's uh, hearing. This application property owner is the applicant's mother-in-law. There's approximately 21 acres uh, on this lot existing. The applicant has a desire to subdivide the property. There would be two lots. One lot would um, be a five acre parcel. The remaining lot would be approximately 15 acres. The property would be rezoned to RA, residential agriculture. That's kind of a transitional uh, zoning in between developed and undeveloped property. Staff believes that this is fitting for the area. And it's also still in alignment with the comp plan. The plat meets all the requirements of the subdivision regulations and zoning ordinance. Um, at this time, we can go ahead and move forward with the public hearing. 
Okay, I am opening this now to the public. Does anybody wish to come forward and speak regarding this matter for or against? Okay, seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing and turn it over to the commissioners. Commissioners, your thoughts, comments? If there's no questions or comments, I guess I'd be prepared to make a motion. Hearing none, I'd make a motion to approve this application based on conformance with the zoning ordinance and subdivision regulations, as well as a lack of perceived negative impact on the surrounding area. Second by Jacobson. Everybody please vote. <laughs> All voted yes, motion carried. Okay, before we move on to the next. Oh, yes. Before I forget, uh, the, this matter will go before the City Council at its December 21st meeting. <clears throat> and before getting into the next set of public hearings, uh, I just want to clarify that these two next hearings are about the redevelopment plan and also zoning and platting for the Jefferson Place edition. So that is what's being considered here tonight. We have had some various emails regarding different issues that do not involve that the items being considered tonight. This is for the redevelopment plan and the platting and zoning related to this issue. And is the applicant oh, here? Oh, okay. Yeah. So 3B is request to rezone the redel redevelopment plan for lots one through 10 and outlet A, Jefferson Place Edition, being a replat of lots one through six and part of lots seven through 11A, lying south and west of Harvell Drive, block 170, Bellevue, together with the adjacent vacated streets, avenues, and alleys. Applicant, Mercury Property Management Incorporated. Journal location, 16th Avenue and Jefferson Street, case number ECD number 53. Good evening, uh, Andrew Willis with Klein Williams on behalf of the applicant. Um, <clears throat> so the redevelopment plan, I, I've got a few slides just to run through a few pictures and to help out as I'm talking about this. But um, so this area was just declared blighted and substandard. That was the previous meeting, uh, your recommendation in the council meeting. And so now this is coming forward with the project um, that's proposed for this area. Um, as you'll see, really, we're talking about about lots one through six, and then parts of lots seven through eleven a. And and I bring that up partially when we start talking about you know what this project is and 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 what we're trying to accomplish and the density we're looking at, particularly with the change of zone. We've got six plus another you know the, the remainder is those you know those partial lots. So, I mean, it's, a, it's eleven lots, and it's about seventy five thousand square feet. So again, when we, when we go into this and look at 10, 10 lots that we're going to propose. It's like 7,500 square feet per unit, which is more than more than required in the current zoning. It just so this is our project site we're looking at here. Um, we should probably let's see. All right. So then, so again, this was this is what that would look like uh, with the propo the project as proposed. When we go forward, it's it's ten lots, but they're rearranged. Obviously, this site, and part of the reason we're, we go through the the blight and substandard, and we're going through this redevelopment project, is to, is because of the the issues there, the particularly the steep grade and the and the issues there. But we've got um, ten lots that would be created, and the out lots uh, it would that would help with the drainage and the and the access points. But again, that's that's the the plat. Um, I'll try to get into it a little bit better. So the site plan, as we look here, we've got we basically got a fourplex and then a duplex as the, uh, for these six uh, units, and then there's a and then a, a, a four units down uh, to the south part. Um, one issue that came up or that's it, that's been raised, uh, the question that was raised had to deal with 
with traffic and access. And so just on this site plan, I want to point out the plan here is these, uh, the, the six units would take access from 16th Avenue here. Um, if you can see my mouse scrolling from the north. And then the other four units would take access from Jefferson Street to the south. Uh, both of these would make sure that they would ensure that there's no change of access to any of the properties uh, adjacent to it. Um, but again, from a traffic perspective, the idea was to split this up so you're not, so even though there's 10 units there, you've got, you know, four units coming from the south and then the six from the north. So uh, trying again to, to mitigate some of those concerns and, and the layout that really seems to work best um, and should, and, and should, uh, Again, make it so that we're not we're not increasing we're not increasing density beyond what would already be potentially possible. But because of the shape, size, slope, we needed to the, the, that there's that's why there's some reconfiguration proposed. Um, again, because of this because of the slope, we get these are some conceptual renderings to show kind of what the the plan is and what these would look like. Again, because of that slope, you're going to have the you're going to have uh, you can see up top you know you'd have your garages. Um, and then it's you know essentially like the walkout basement on the back, so it's it's built on that that slope. So that's that's you know they're going to be these are going to be very you know well crafted, very nice looking uh, properties. Uh, that's you know, I, you know ideally what we're trying to accomplish here um, with this project. Again, where the plan really helps us mitigate some of the difficulties. Again, I've got a couple more pictures there, but it's kind of the similar things. I can go back and talk about any of these later. These uh. I'll at least just go through these slides real quick. Um, I won't spend time on the floor plans, but three to four bedroom units. So this is a four bedroom uh, showing, you know, lower level and upper level. And if you want to take a look at those closer, we can. <laughs> but then, so, but again, mainly, then we get to, again, this is a redevelopment plan. Just want to make sure I highlight the, you know, the, the tax increment financing. Uh, the way we looked at the tax increment financing here, um, if you build out all 10 of these lots, we think the value is going to be about, we've used $3,150,000. Three um, that's incremental, uh, so that'd be $315,000 per unit. Uh, incremental value then really creates a TIF of $750,000. Now there's about $860,000 identified in, in these costs that are just to get this project, you know, the acquisition and really mainly, ma mainly all the, the civil site work. Um, and then, you know, getting, relocating some of the utilities, uh, doing the grading, doing all of that. Uh, there's going to be some retaining walls put in. I might slide back up to one, another, another concern that was raised was, you know, obviously with drainage is going to be an issue here. Uh, there's going to be some retaining walls put in along the property edge. There's also a 15 foot landscape buffer that's, that's proposed. Again, this is all just to mitigate any, any concerns. Um, with this, with this going in, but again, those are just additional costs, and that's pro primarily because of the the, the the topography we're dealing with here, and, and the unusual and the difficult development. Um, sorry, let me get back down to TIF uses, and again, um, so part of why this is a redevelopment plan is. Trying to keep those houses at about three hundred thousand dollars, and without again, we've got eight hundred sixty thousand dollars of just of cost to get this ready to go. So without TIF, uh, all of a sudden these units are we're looking at four hundred thousand uh, dollars. And again, we're trying to create good quality units there. Uh, there'll be ten units on this on this on this site. Um, I think it'll be really it'll be you know good quality units, but just couldn't be done otherwise. And that's that's really the impetus behind this. Um, again, this just details a little more on that. 536,000 in civil site work. Mainly, we got a couple uh, utilities to relocate, relocate uh, retaining walls, get put in, doing some grading, um, everything else. Um, and when we look at this, particularly here, you know, the, the redevelopment plan, and we should be looking at whether this is in conformance with the comprehensive plan. So I, picked, I, I pulled a couple quotes out of the comprehensive plan for the city. Um, this is infill development in a particularly difficult lot in Old Town. So, uh, you know, the top quote, you know, this is just from the survey as part of the, as part of the comprehensive plan. Um, what are the things you like least about Bellevue? The most prevalent response was taxes 
and the, and the plan says additional development within the city limits will increase the city of Bellevue's tax base. It can improve, improve its fiscal status. Uh, infill development within Bellevue could have a beneficial effect on the city's tax rate. Um, <clears throat> a couple of, you know, one of the weaknesses of the Old Town District was the lack of housing diversity. Again, we're trying to create a different type of housing, uh, you know, that, that's going to complement the, the area, but again, provide some of that housing diversity that's lacking here. Um, one of the recommendations for Old Town District was increased housing style and diversity in Old Town. The existing housing stock is very consistent, lacks diversity. Um, benefit from some construction of larger homes and upscale multifamily residents, including townhouses and row houses. Again, this is, this is what's set in the comprehensive plan. I feel like we're hitting, the, hitting these points pretty well with this project. And again, without creating what would otherwise, we're not putting in a large multifamily apartment. This is still 10 units, which is, which is really in line with what <clears throat> the space could hold anyway. Um, again, more of the same. We've got, uh, this is just at the table, kind of talking about the needed, needed additional um, uh, acres of housing. And again, this is, from the, this is from the comprehensive plan. But again, it, this, everything falls right in line with the comprehensive plan for this project. Um, if you want infill housing, if you want that housing diversity, this really hits all those points. Um, as far as the overall plan, part of what we look at is in the redevelopment plan, and obviously this is the next issue as well, but because of the, uh, because of the layout and what's required, that's where that change of zone uh, comes in. But again, we're not, we're not trying to create extensive density. We're not doing anything like that. We're really trying to make this site developable at all. Um, and that's where TIF comes in to make it so we can, <clears throat> so we can create these lots and create these units at a reasonable price. I mean, bring that down to where we think it's reasonable. Uh, it should be a really a benefit for all, um, benefit for the town. And we think it's a great idea. And again, I think it, it, I just wanted to hit, make sure I hit those points that <clears throat> were addressed and probably will be addressed again tonight in opposition. But really looking at uh, the traffic issue, we're trying to separate that traffic to make it so we're not having you know major traffic. Uh, and there's only 10 lots there or 10 units there. Um, grading is everything is really done to make sure uh, that it shouldn't if it should have no negative impact on the neighborhood. And <clears throat> with that, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions you have. Okay, I will open it up now to the public <coughs> hearing. Before I do, remember this is about the redevelopment plan we are being considered. We are considering here at this time, and also uh, we have a lot of people here, and as such, uh, you will have five minutes to speak, so we can make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Okay. Uh, is there anybody here who wishes to speak for or against this proposal? I'm, I'm sorry, if you, if you want to come up and speak, you need to do so by coming to the podium and saying and stating your name and signing in. Yes, ma'am, but we need to have you come to the podium. Please sign in and state your name and address for the record, please. Margaret Rammer, 101 East 16th Avenue. Uh, several residents uh, wanted to compile questions uh, regarding this development and uh, so those were emailed to you. Uh, five minutes doesn't cover the amount of questions there were so I didn't hear those mentioned when you mentioned the... Uh, if if uh, I received the email from you I received it anonymously and so there was about it had said it was an email where you wish to remain anonymous it was not forwarded to the planning commissioners and there was a large number of questions I received about an hour ago. I didn't have time to address them all. So my advice would be any questions that you folks want out onto the record, any questions that you have, this is a great opportunity to ask them. Staff, the applicant, applicant's attorney, we can all address them. Uh, okay, I asked. For it to stay private if possible 
So you decided to keep it anonymous and not have any of the questions go forward? I didn't, I didn't realize it was something you wanted forwarded to the entire commission because typically when we don't have a name and address to put with it, I can't put it out into the public record. So, and again, it was a situation too where there was probably about 150 questions. I wouldn't have time to answer all those right before the meeting. So that's why we have these public hearings. Any questions you have, any questions anybody in the audience has, go ahead and ask them and then we'll keep track of them and we will make sure they get answered. Uh, okay, well, the first question is, can those questions be answered at a later date before any decision is made? This is the forum to have those questions answered, so it should be done here because these folks are gonna make a decision tonight. They can either vote to recommend approval, vote to recommend denial, um, but any questions that the neighborhood has, that's kind of the purpose of the public hearing is to get those out in front of these folks and then have them answered, whether it's by staff or whether it's by the developer. But you give each resident five minutes to ask all questions in the time allotted? If there are questions specific to the development, yes. I mean, we've got a lot of folks that want to speak. Um, if there's questions, I know some of your questions on the email were, who will pick up their trash? Will they have recycling? If this is approved, these folks who live in the city limits, they'd have the same utilities, same trash, same recycling that you would currently have. That would all be done by through city services. So things like that. Um, if there's questions that are just generic, um, but also if there's specific questions to the development, again, this is the forum to ask those. Uh, I guess I would ask, when it, will the development occur if it is approved and how long will it last? Will it be in a phased um, manner? Where will the construction trucks park? When will the construction go on? Uh, what will be the hours? Will it be Monday through Friday, also weekends? Um, it continues to talk about the blight and substandard studies, uh, but I didn't see those anywhere. If they are somewhere, can they be given to the public um, so that we ha can make some fully informed uh, decisions about our neighborhood? Um, the, the repeated blight and substandard conditions and the difficulties in the construction, why is it that Bellevue has not done anything about that blight and what is a substandard condition and uh, have they considered what that would do or how that will delay um, the development and construction and the traffic uh, conditions. I'm not sure if you're a legal representative or what, but he, can talk, he talked about mitigating the traffic issues why are we even talking about traffic issues to begin with? Um, also, this area under development, will any of the trees be kept? Are those trees uh, virgin? Are they original? Are they part of Fontenelle Forest to begin with? Or did Bellevue plant them at some point? Um, and if so, did they? why are they under blight conditions? How, what are the ecological and environmental studies that have been done? Uh, I know a lot of other people have questions. Uh, if there's any time left, I'll come back up and keep asking. Is, is that acceptable? And what we'll do too is we'll kind of keep track of all the questions that come up from the public. Um, like I said, between staff and between the applicant, we will go through all of them once we kind of get through the public hearing. That way, if people have the same questions, we don't keep repeating them, um, but we will keep track, we'll keep a list, okay? Um, so we will try to make sure that we get through everything. And like I said, applicant can speak specifically to construction timeline, and then we'll go through some of the other items as well, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak specifically to the redevelopment plan that's being considered right now? Uh, hi, my name, is, our names are Bill and Connie Golden. We live at uh, 1712 Franklin Street, which is the corner of Franklin and 18th Avenue. Um, 
one reason we don't like this whole project is being blighted and substandard, and I know that's not your area, but um, the pictures were taken right after a storm, and now everybody is now blighted, it looks like, forever. Uh, Franklin Street, our area, was has been burned by the planning department and the city council before. We've got those two dumps, those two duplexes down the street. We tried to fight them and um, they're sitting there empty. I dare any one of you to go up there and try and lean against the railing, they're awful. And But they're not blighted, they're across the street. So, um, I hope all of you have taken a trip up to Jefferson Street and walked that area uh, because those units, cramming them in there is pretty crazy. There's going to get more traffic and Franklin's going to get part of it and we don't need any more of that. Um, we were very thankful for some of the city council members actually walked around and talked to everybody and we really appreciated that. Um, then it ended up being a tie vote and the mayor got to pick. Um, I wish that we could have been asked more with by Mercury, maybe had more meetings with them, uh, because cramming those 10 townhouses, which will be more like 20 more cars, right into that area, and especially up on Jefferson Street, it's really crowded up there if you go there. And I don't know how they think they can cram them in there and then have anything get in there, like um, what's if there's a fire? Uh, what's if they need emergency vehicles or an ambulance? Uh, there's not really much room. Um, at least off of Harvell, the, the smaller part they were gonna have, you can go off and on Harvell. But I think up by Jefferson, those should be just not even put in there. Um, we're all taxpayers here, and I know it's about the money, but you should care about us too. Thank you. who had the interview with the World Herald. Um, Could you sign in, please? I will. I live at 1703 Jefferson Street. At the last meeting, it was the first time I'd ever been to a meeting like this. I've never had an issue like this ever in my life. So I had no idea that they would be voted on at that meeting. I feel it was evidence of conflict of interest and uh, it brings it about to political corruption as far as I'm concerned. In the World Herald, Jack Gold, Gould, of the Watchdog Group, Common Cause Nebraska said, from a moral, if not legal standpoint, Mayor Hike should be transparent about any connections to the developers and previous ownership. He made a lot of money off that property and now wants to call our neighborhood blighted and substandard. I know this is probably not something I should say, but he wants a development of old, of old, in Old Town he might have considered selling at a lower rate so they had some more money for their taxes also. Um, that's the biggest thing that's bothering me is I don't want my property value going down because like it said in the paper by the Bellevue City Attorney Bree Robinson that the state law is currently written, the designation blighted and substandard does not go away after redevelopment. Now, what do we do when our houses are counted as blighted and substandard and we lose our value of our homes so they can give free taxes? That's what bothers me. Again, this is just to consider the redevelopment plan. So does anybody want to speak specifically to that? Have any comments about that? Hello, my name is Steve Compton. 
<clears throat> no relation to Dave. Uh, and I live at 802 Cole Road in Bellevue. Uh, this is also my first attendance at a uh, planning department meeting. And I'm present, um, not, do not live in the neighborhood, but do drive on Harvell Drive down Franklin and through Old Town frequently. Um, I concur with the need that there's housing div uh, diversity needed in the city of Bellevue, and that's an admirable goal. Admirable goal. But I think in this case, the site that's been selected for this development is just a very poor alternative location for meeting that goal. Uh, not only is the site poor, there are multiple infrastructure issues as well as environmental impact issues I think the board should consider. There's a significant amount of work that needs to be done at the parcel, including accommodating this specific development requires in concert not only the redevelop redevelopment plan but also the rezoning. Um, so that should speak volumes. It will require complete clearing of vegetation and trees, mature trees and areas that provide habitat for big game wildlife and avian species, significant grading and cut and fill in order to accommodate this, a new permanent road, um, as well as relocation of existing utilities and retaining walls. For all of those reasons, it should be very obvious that this is not a great site for this development and should be opposed by and not approved by the board. I did not see in the documentation any statement that this uh, proposed development would be consistent with the character of the community, including the forested green space. I did not see any stormwater management plan that addresses the issue that I'm sure you're aware if you've driven on Harvell that after major storm events because of the major drainage area coming down from the north from Downing Pool area, that that area where the existing utilities are, the mode area is frequently flooded after storm events. So there's already a significant drainage issue there and stormwater management will be a significant challenge. There's also no grading plan that I saw. It's noted that there are steep slopes, retaining walls, et cetera. I'm not sure how you can approve this without understanding what the grading and drainage management plans would be it's already been noted that there's been no traffic study. Are there any traffic control changes that would be made at the intersections to accommodate the additional traffic, um, as well as the relocation of the existing utilities itself, who's gonna be fitting the bill for, for that, those changes, as well as the natural resources I noted. So I'm sure anyone who's been through that area notices that there's the uh, deer warning signs on Harvell, on the north and south ends near Franklin, and there's a reason for that. If you look at a landscape level and look at the forested areas, this provides a continuous wildlife habitat corridor from this area to uh, Fontenelle Forest and further to the west. And that's why there's so many wildlife there. There would be a concern that there'd be increased roadkill by cutting out the forest and uh, <laughs> restricting the travel corridors for wildlife through this area, as well as uh, uh, direct impact to migratory bird, migratory bird habitats. And I would just have the board consider you might take a look at the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. Take a look at that and see that uh, what violations would be covered, uh, would, be a, uh, would result from this activity without some mitigation. So in the end, I'm opposed to this development. I think there are better sites for this development, for uh, better sites to accommodate the ultimate goal of the city to have diverse housing. And uh, again, I am formally on the record as opposed to this development. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to come up and speak related to this matter? My name is Matt Griffith. Um, I live at 1701 Franklin Street, so uh, adjacent to the development area. Um, I 
would like to thank uh, Mr. Compton. He brought up many of the points that I have been thinking about, but he did it in a very salient way. Um, I would add the, um, in addition to interrupting the migratory patterns and the greenway spaces, the displaced animals will become a nuisance in residents' yards. Um, they will be on Jefferson, er, they'll be on Jefferson, Franklin, Harvell. Um, Franklin and Harvell are both very, very busy streets, um, as I can attest, <laughs> living. Um, in addition, I too believe this is the wrong development for the wrong space. Um, the, the grade of the hill is, I don't understand how it can be done without excessive construction um, to do it safely and to keep drainage where it needs to be. Um, I realize that Bellevue is not near maxed out on the tax, the TIF uh, land space, but again, there's no way to reverse that. So at such time where this development project is being considered for that, which they have stated, this does not make sense without the tax incentive financing, then if this, this is just going to hamstring Bellevue at some point. I, again, we have plenty of right now, but um, you know, at one point we had plenty of buffaloes in America um, roaming the plains. And if you, if you harvest them all without doing it sensically, um, they go away. So um, drainage, safety with the culvert, if these are going to be family residents, um, that drainage point at the bottom of the hill, I've said it before, I think will be a problem with kids. They are going to go to it. They're going to gravitate to it. And um, I just have concerns about that. The, the developers uh, in the article stated uh, that they would be potentially providing uh, sidewalks or um, improving water pressure that sort of thing. Again, the, the water pressure is going to be affected by this development. So the development is making the need for this, this adjustment. And the sidewalks, uh, as been attested many times, there is no place to put sidewalks on Jefferson Street uh, without taking homeowners' properties. Um, so I, I don't see how that how they're going to deliver on those promises. And uh, I those are my concerns. So thank you for your time. Anyone else? My name's Tony Boyd at 1701 Jefferson Street. And first would just like to say that not just myself, but those who won't stand up to speak, everybody that we've talked to in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. there's not been one person that has been for this redevelopment. Everybody's been against it. One of the things that was addressed by multiple people was the lack of environmental or traffic studies done. That point has been brought up multiple times at multiple meetings. And before you can vote yay or nay against this, I think those studies need to be done. Again, those points have been brought up in previous meetings, but nobody's seemed to address those. As well as their redevelopment plan itself, the hindrance of traffic, Jefferson Street is horrible for street parking as it is. The little amount of driveway and street they're gonna put in, four bedroom homes, minimum of two cars, possibly three or four or more. If you get that many more cars on Jefferson Street, there's no place to park on that street as it is. So if you get 
four more homes on Jefferson Street with three or four more cars each, it's just going to make traffic and parking an absolute nightmare. Same thing with 16th, the six units down on 16th Ave. We can sit here, poke holes, object to this all day for hours on end, but our objections just fall on deaf ears with everybody. City Council, Planning Commission, this has already been decided. We're here speaking out in objection to it, but we did that a month ago. Still nothing happened. Everybody voted yes. So everybody in town is just sick of sick of this city administration and this city planning everybody everybody is just sick of this city administration because you do not listen to the people for once in decades just do what everybody is asking you to do vote no on this if you don't do that you're not listening to the people and there's some type of agenda underneath the surface that everybody's been calling out or people are too afraid to say. I just ask that you do what's right, what everybody is asking and vote no. Anyone else? Hi, Bernard Kusick, 1802 Jefferson. Oh, I'm just... I'm really sad. I'm sad about the, even the way our last meeting went. It just kind of, it's sad. No one's listening. I voted for Mayor Hike. He's supposed to represent me. All of you are supposed to represent us, the people that live in Bellevue. If we weren't paying our taxes, there would not be jobs. There would not be anything. But we're forgetting about the heart of the people. And you guys are making rules, and I'm sorry, but it kind of came to me. I think it's Luke 23. And it says, woe you lawyers and politicians that make rules that you do not have to abide by. And I'm sorry, but I did not write that. I did not write that. But no one here in this council or anyone's really hearing us said, hey, it's going to cost a lot of money. We're going to blight it out to get the tax advantage and just do this. We don't care about anyone. Mayor Hikes said, I'm breaking the damn thing. We're doing this. Well, why do we do things? For power and for money or prestige, which I want no part of. All I want, all I'm asking for is that this gets rejected. Here, they're going to have to demolish everything. A half a mil of landscaping with this equipment, hauling stuff out, what they're going to break and everything, I can't see it being done for half a mil. They're gonna to have to level everything, start over. The utility's insufficient. I have 40 pounds of water pressure. I'm not to the top of the hill. Is the sewer gonna handle this? Are they gonna take them while they're doing this, separate the storm from the septic? I doubt it's gonna be done. And then they even have places like this. If we're gonna buy, am I gonna spend $400,000 They live right next door, butt it up to someone else, and then I don't like the smell of their trash, I don't like their dog, and I'm right in the same building. Then I got a two-car garage, and oh, I got a backyard, probably as big as this area right here, which is fine, but it's not very aesthetic. Now, I know I sound angry, but I think everyone here is coming here to look because we're angry. No one's listening. Now, I'm not scared to speak up. There's right and there's wrong. No matter, it was an old movie, I'm sorry, but Buford Pusser and Walking Tall. It's, there's right and there's wrong no matter what side of the law you are on. And the same with you people. I hope you can represent us and please bring this to a close. They can build somewhere else. 
that we can put this back. You know, I'm sure we all will take chip in and buy this property for what a mayor took and got it for. We can all return the money and have this done legally, and we can go back. And we'll all take and pay the taxes on it as a public park. We can work something out. We want to keep the habitat, the trees, and the drive. Thank you. Anyone else to speak specifically to the TIF or the redevelopment plan? All right, no one else is, I'm sorry, ma'am, you've, you've been up here once before. We've had your five minutes to speak. I'm sorry, but it's limited to, to five minutes per person. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, in terms that the plans are Could you please speak, to... come to the microphone so we can hear you? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, the, um, the plans are preliminary in nature and subject to change. Is, is, that, is that correct? The de development plans? So, so they're being voted on today at, while preliminary and they'll be able to be changed after that? Is that correct? So there's two items tonight. There is a redevelopment plan that addresses the TIF, the financial side of things. That does have a site plan attached, but it addresses specifically the TIF. Then the next agenda item is a request to rezone and then um, small subdivision plat the property. With the kind of zoning that they're requesting, it also requires site plan approval. Um, with that site plan approval, if it's approved by city council, that's what specifically they would be required to build. Um, now, things like construction materials, um, utilities, grading, drainage, with the site plan approval, staff does require they submit preliminary dra uh, drainage and grading and utilities. Um, those will all get finalized with a building permit. If approved by city council, this developer, like any other, would have to go through the appropriate permit process through um, construction permits, grading permits, uh, SWIP construction, uh, stormwater retention, all of that. So with the site plan approval, again, if that specific footprint is approved, that's what they would have to do, that's what they would have to build, and that's where they would have to build it. Um, but again, like the other construction plans, the aesthetics, the um, grading plans, all that, the very specific plan would be finalized through the permit process. Okay. So I don't know if that helps answer some of those questions, but what you are seeing for site plan where they have the units laid out, if the plan is approved that way, that's what they would be expected to build. For example, they couldn't show a fourplex and a duplex and then come back and put in a sixplex or an eightplex. They would have to do that very specific type of construction as what was approved with the site plan if city council approves it. All right, thank you. And the council are the same ones that uh, review the per permits and approve those? No, so city council would um, vote on the redevelopment plan. They would vote on the zoning and they would vote on the plat. If the change of zone is approved, if the site plan is approved, then the applicant would have to come back through the permit process. They would have to go through, apply for their construction permits, their building permits, electrical permits. They would have to apply for their grading permit. They would um, at that time be evaluated by um, all of the city staff, uh, permits and inspections, public works, fire. Again, everyone would look at it from a construction standpoint. So. I don't know if this helps. This is kind of the development standpoint. Um, the construction would come, that review would come later on down the road if they're approved by city council. But they, they would have to have the zoning, the site plan, and the platting approved first to come in and request those construction permits. They can't request permits without that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, everyone.
everybody. I'm Michelle Goldapp, and I live at 1712 Jefferson. And um, thank you, Mr. Compton. He had some amazing points about this, but I would just like to know this rede redevelopment plan. What is your plan? Um, it's already busy crazy. What are you gonna do to build this? We don't have any parking. We already have issues Ma'am, all the time. Sorry, can I'm I sorry. have you speak into the mic so oh, we can pick you up? I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, the, when the construction goes on, where is this happening? How are we going to get in and out of our homes? We already have some issues with parking with some of us getting out of our driveways. You're going to have all these builders up and down. I mean, we work all different hours of the day. Are we going to be able to get in and out? I mean, this is a big, big, big development plan. They're taking a whole area, a whole natural area out. How are we going, I mean, what is their plan to get all this equipment in without disturbing our, our living circumstances? That's a really big issue. We have families. We're here, be, we bought these homes because we like the peace and quiet there. We love our forests. We're the little bit left of Fontenot Forest on that end. Why take away that from us? We purchased our homes. We wanted to, I've lived in Bellevue all my life, moved away for a while and came back. I am here for a reason. We all purchased our homes here. Everybody wants to sell. Of course, that'll be great for a hike or whoever's got the investments in there, but that's not good for us. We live here, we purchased our homes, we wanna stay here. How are you going to keep, how are you going to do all this without disturbing? You know, I, th that would be a really big, big issue for us as well. Thank you for taking the time. Anyone else? Okay, seeing nobody else to speak, I will close the public hearing and well, allow the applicant to come up and, and address some of these questions that have been raised. I think, I'm happy to answer any questions. I mean, I, I think we've already kind of laid out what this step is versus the overall process. Part of, part of the problem is uh, the opposition wants additional constraints on the developer that aren't there. Um, you know, if there, you know, a traffic study and environmental study are not required for uh, this and so it should not be part of that um, things with as far as construction and and these things you know we, we can talk I mean right now we think it's gonna be a 18 month construction process and we're you know we're gonna have to figure out what the staging is and probably start from the north and work south but again that's part of the building permit and the construct I mean that's part of the permitting process we haven't got there yet and and, and this is this is the approval of a redevelopment plan to see if this can be developed um, a couple of people probably made the points better than I did when they said how difficult this site is. That's exactly why we're here with putting a redevelopment plan and asking for tax increment financing for the exact reasons they're saying, this is a hard lot to build or a hard site to develop. So that, I mean, I probably couldn't have said any better of why this is necessary, the additional grading, the re utility relocation, that's why we're here. That's, that's, that's why we need a uh, tip and why we're asking for the redevelopment plan. Um, and again, everything else really, that's that's trying to be asked for is probably part of the permitting process that we'll have to we'll have to address we'll have to do that but again it's not part of of where we're at right now um, and again I think beyond that I'm, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions you have and I can and I can address anything more specifically but that's you know in a big picture that's really that's really where we're at and again this this is we're not coming in with massive density we're coming in with 10 units in a place that could hold 10 units now other than the other than the the grading we're looking at mid you know trying to create you know the, the traffic patterns and drives that will separate the traffic and and address these issues now again we have to go through the whole permitting process here um and and again i guess i'd be yeah i'm happy to answer any questions you have beyond that uh, Ms. Palm, do you want to address some of the ones that were brought up that relate to the city? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, 
I'll go ahead and uh, try to address what was brought up from a city standpoint. As far as traffic is concerned, um, let me explain a little bit about the city's review process on these. Um, when we get these types of requests in, I'll speak in generic terms because I realize some of these questions probably don't pertain to the redevelopment plan, but since they were raised, I'll go ahead and address them. Um, when applications come in, there's probably anywhere from 10 to 15 different city staff departments, Sarpy County Public Works, uh, Police Chief, Fire Chief, uh, public works, <clears throat> permits and inspections, um, and applications such as a platting and a zoning and site plan. City staff look at that and raise any concerns that they have through a review process. Um, typically, there's um, several months worth of discussions and planning behind the scenes that happen prior to a public hearing. So as far as traffic is concerned, uh, city staff did look at it, did look at the density, <coughs> Um, our engineering department did not request a traffic study based on the fact that um, city staff believes that 10 units, the four units that will be serviced from Jefferson and the remaining units that will be serviced um, off of 16th, that it would be able to be dealt with and it would be those streets and those access points are designed to handle um, the impact of those 10 additional homes. So a traffic study was not requested. Um, questions were raised, were raised in regards to the trees, um, whether the city has planted any down there, not to my knowledge, that's pr private property. Um, I assume that's just been forested area that's been there. I'm unaware of whether or not that's original to Fontenelle Forest. I, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. I, I don't know. Um, but like I said, to my knowledge, city has never planted any trees down there um, since it's private property. Um, as far as environmental study, um, the applicant's attorney is correct. That's not something um, that is standard to require of a developer. Um, city is unaware of any environmental issues down there, but again, through the construction process, if anything will, would come up, um, there could be some addition, additional regulations or requirements that would be addressed at that time. I know there's been a lot of discussion on the blight and substandard designation. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's something that happened previously. It's, it's already been done, so I don't know. We really can't speak a whole lot to that tonight because this board can't change that. Um, it's something that exists, and as a result of it existing, yes, the area is TIF eligible, which brings us to tonight's application. Um, questions about emergency vehicles getting in and out. Again, it was reviewed by uh, our fire department, reviewed by our police department. They did not have any concerns about emergency vehicles being able to access this potential development. Um, let me see what else. As far as stormwater and uh, grading, yes. Um, a preliminary drainage and grading was submitted. At this point, that is what is required. Again, final design will be done if city council approves this zoning and this platting final design of that and permitting would all be done through the permits process. That's an entirely separate review process. But at this point, um, our city engineers are comfortable with what the applicant is presenting for stormwater and drainage. Um, just speaking a little bit to the guidelines that developers are held to, the city of Bellevue is part of the Papio watershed. So like everyone else in the Metro Omaha area, we adhere to the same regulations. The developer will be required to, um, they can't negatively impact neighbors. They can't force runoff or additional water onto your properties. And it's city staff's responsibility to make sure on a, a drainage and grading plan that that does not happen. Um, they will also be required to you know, contain the first half inch of runoff. They will do that. Um, but main thing to understand is they cannot negatively impact anybody's property with this development. Um, and again, any developer in the city would be held to that standard because it's, we're part of the overall Papio Watershed District. Sorry, one moment as I'm kind of going through these.
as far as timing, construction, things of that nature, uh, Mr. Willis kind of touched on that. Um, there are certain measures that have to be taken and adhered to by the developer again during that construction process as far as um, erosion, um, dirt work, things of that nature. Um, again, city staff monitors that if this development is approved and if construction permits are approved, that's all done during that process. Um, I think specific details about timing of construction, things of that nature, again, would have to be answered by the applicant. You know, city staff wouldn't be able to answer those specific questions. I think, unless anyone thinks I missed anything, I think that was most of the questions that came up. And as previously mentioned, these would be on city services, city water, sewer, uh, trash, just like anybody else in the neighborhood. Um, they will have the opportunity for recycling all of those services as well. Um, I think that's it, unless anybody has any other questions that I can answer. All right, at this time, I'm going to close the public hearing and turn it over to the commissioners. <clears throat> commissioners, questions, comments? I just, I just got a couple statements that I'd like to end up making. I mean, probably don't pertain a whole lot to this, but it does, because I heard a lot of it from you folks out there. Um, the city council meeting and the planning commission, they are two different bodies. Um, you know, with us, we're kind of driven by rules and regulations that we go by that's laid down in front of us to take and make our decisions. And, and that's what we base our decisions on, not politics or anything. Um, so we really don't have any ties to the city council people and the mayor at all. Them are a whole different body. We are driven by rules and regulations and the stuff that Tammy talked about. I hate to say it, but they're the political portion if a person wants to go in front of them, not us. Um, the other thing I just want to share with you because I, I heard a lot of it and it, it's already been all said and done. And um, I hate the word blighted and substandard. I really do. Um, I was faced with a decision I said on the planning commission many years ago when we blighted Mission Street going down. And I blighted my own building. And I'm not right on the main Mission Street. I'm off because we went two blocks on each side. And a lot of people think that, you know, just because you're blighted, your property value is going to drop. And mine's continued to rise and rise to, I don't like it because i got to pay more taxes on it and everything. But just because somebody is, you know, this, this blight and substandard is a tool. It's a tool for development. It's not set by us. It's set by legislator and stuff. And hopefully they're going to change that wording someday. But I just want to go on record and say that to you folks, you know, that um, we are a different party than what the city council is. And we are driven in a different manner um, than what they are. So that's all I got to say. Commissioner Ritz. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of quick statements myself. Um, for those in the audience, I just want you guys to know um, I wasn't here when this came up for the blighted. Kind of wish I was. I live six, seven blocks away over by Bertha. So I travel this intersection literally daily. Um, so I want you to know that there is somebody here that is familiar with this area. Um, the couple of items that I'm gonna point out is, I noticed on the TIF Exhibit B, your line 24 and 25 don't make sense um, because you've got seven inch thick concrete is cheaper than five inch thick concrete when you switch from square foot to square feet or square yard to square feet. So, um, Essentially, you're saying seven inch is five, 555 a square foot and five inch is $12 a square foot. So it's kind of kind of pointed that out to you. Um, my biggest item on this, I mean, second biggest is traffic. I am very hesitant on adding any more to that, that three-way Y intersection, whatever you want to call it. Um, just it's a, it's a scary intersection. There's turkeys and deer 
and everybody speeds on there. Just putting that out there. My biggest in, um, issue with the TIF is this is a TIF application to pay for units that are going to come in at about $300,000. My, I've been living in Old Town now for almost for almost a decade. 300,000 is the high end of Old Town. Um, in my mind, TIF should be used for developing properties that would help alleviate or provide better housing. I know that TIF is used for to develop properties that would not be developed otherwise. But as stated, the sloping issues, the constraints of this property make it so expensive to, to develop that even with TIF, these are gonna still be $300,000 properties when all the properties in mo most of the properties in Old Town are 250 or less. Um, that and you know the idea of Old Town, the, old, the area is houses, smaller, bigger. I'd love to see bigger houses, um, but that maintain the same idea of a house with a yard, spacing. Um, so I guess, like I said, my biggest thing with providing with approving TIF on this is that we're approving tax increment financing for properties that are going to be best case scenario more expensive than all the others in the area. So I just want to kind of go on record and state where my position is on this one. Any other comments or questions, commissioners? Commissioner Arney? Yeah, probably a, question for a couple of questions for staff here. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the density, and I think, I think it'd be important for us to understand, when was this area originally platted? This is part of original Bellevue. Um, so it's been that way for decades and decades. Um, as the developer's uh, attorney pointed out, a lot of them are smaller, non-conforming lots, part of lots. Um, I looked at the plat book uh, just today. Again, it's in our original plat book. We started zoning in Bellevue in 1965. Um, and again, the legal description is the original Bellevue town itself. So it probably predates that 1965 easily. Um, the RD60 zoning has been in place from what I can tell since 1965. Mm -hmm. um, that current density is 6,000 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. So in theory, you could put, you know, a house every 6,000 square feet. That's the that's a density. It's a it's a medium density residential, um, but it does allow for smaller houses, smaller lots. Um, under this particular application, there's about 75,000 square feet. It's about 1.71 acres. Um, so there will be you know, approximately 7,500 square feet per unit of lot area. That would That's how the density would shake out under this current site plan. Okay. So there's, there's just a lot of questions and comments about keeping the forest and nature. But prior to the majority of us in this room, the 60s, you're saying this has always been intended to be houses on these lots, correct? Correct. And it's been platted that way for it's, a long, it's long time. It's platted for residential for, development. Okay. It, was, it was never intended to be left as a forest. Okay. Um, I know that the developer owns all of this now, but um, are these lots still legal lots they could build on? Instead of doing a development like this, could they come in and build six to eight actual houses on all those individual lots? Angela, could you pull up GIS again? Yeah, if they're platted lots of record and they have at least 75% of their lot area, yes. As you can see, some of the lots that front along Harvell into Franklin, they're curved. You'd never meet the setbacks on those little pieces of lots. Okay. Um, but yes, the other lots, in theory, you could build on. So maybe just a comment that, you know, those of you that are neighbors, they could come in today and build six, seven houses there and not even be in front of us or the or city council or anything. They, they have the right to come in and build on those lots the way they sit today. I would assume then they also have the right to come in and remove all the trees without anybody's approval today. Not even not even getting this approval or not, that tomorrow they can go cut down all the trees they want, correct? Correct. If it's private property, the city doesn't control if they clear the, the land of trees or not. Okay. And then maybe just a question for the developer. So is the plan to completely clear the site clear, or are you guys going to do your best to keep some of the trees in place? I think the plan is to the 
to the extent possible to keep the trees there. And I know there's, I know it's preliminary. I understand yeah. that, but just you do what you can to protect. I don't know what that's going to be, but yeah, it's not to clear everything out and start from nothing. It's to, to the extent possible to. More trees. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you, Tammy. With the grading and the sewer work, well, 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 sorry, done. sorry, but we have closed the public hearing. We have closed the public hearing. So, um, real quick, from a construction standpoint, I am work for a construction company. The grading and that would be necessary to do anything reasonable. You would take out all the trees. For the record, there's no way you can save all, any more than maybe two percent of those trees. Just letting you know that there's a huge slope elevation difference and to do anything there, you're gonna take them out and just would not be economical, so. Question for staff. Some of the questions that came up on Jefferson Street in terms of improvements or where there would be more parking. I don't know if we can bring that up a little closer. Obviously at dead ends there currently, is the developer gonna be required to widen the current Jefferson Street that's there or just install what would be continuance of Jefferson Street to meet the one quad? City staff looked at that and the current site plan doesn't show, let me backtrack. So, the city would never improve Jefferson all the way to the north. Um, it would not be impossible, but it would be extremely costly because under today's engineering guidelines, you can't have more than a 10% slope. Um, so that was one of the things that city staff and engineering took into consideration. Um, we looked at it a couple different ways. Uh, the city is not asking the developer to come in and improve any part of the street. Um, because of the unique situation you have there now with private driveways that are in the street, um, it, it's one of those deals where we try to look at what's least disruptive. So what the developer is proposing is essentially continuing the practice of what is there now where Jefferson currently dead ends. They would in fact be adding a private driveway for their units. So they would not be improving Jefferson and widening it, they would just be putting in private drives for their units and utilizing a portion of the right of way to do that. So if instead we required the developer to improve Jefferson to current standard, you'd actually take away quite a few feet from the current yards Correct. that are there? Because you have a lot of non-conforming houses and structures in that area. A lot of them sit very close to the property line. You have some structures that are in the right of way. Um, so it's it's a very unique situation just because as with any infill development, there's there's additional challenges. So um, that was one of the things that we looked at. Yeah, you can see where Angela has, there's, you know, you've got structures that are in the right of way. Um, and again, so if we have someone come in and improve that street, that's going to have an impact to that neighborhood. In terms of, we had some questions on stormwater and separation of storm sewer, I guess, and raw sewage, I guess, Mr. Willis, or if the engineer is here for the applicant, can you maybe walk through how the outlots are designed? So again, I think Ms. Paul mentioned that modern planning standards, they have to account for their own water and drainage. I guess, can you walk through what the uses of outlot A will be? up along Harville Drive, along as, as well as Outlot A, just north of the Jefferson Street improvement? Yes, uh, well, I'm the civil engineer. I'm Fortino uh, Ramirez. Um, the idea is to use Lot A for both um, what's going to be a sanitary sewer easement and stormwater management. Um, it already existing is used for that. We are just planning on realigning things to fit. Um, what we're proposing. Um, I think if you turn on uh, the sanitary sewer uh, network on the GIS, um, it'll make more sense. Or the, the site plan, if we put it up there, um, it'll be easier to talk. Stacy, can you turn on the overhead projector for us? Thank you. 
Or I got a flash drive as well. Oh, there we go. Use this mic for me. Let's see. That's existing sanitary sewer. And I believe right now it does something like this, comes in here and finishes there. What we're looking at doing is just realigning here. So taking it from this point. Could you um, speak up, speak up a little bit, please? Yeah, sorry about that. Existing sanitary sewer is here up in this corner. This is 16th and uh, Jefferson. Existing, it comes straight into about this area here then comes down into this manhole down here. What we're planning on doing is what is shown in dark um, and is called out as relocated eight inch PVC sanitary sewer. So capturing it here, then bringing it down through outlaw A for a direct connection with existing. That's sanitary sewer. So now, that sanitary sewer line currently connects with everybody uphill, the development further no. north and west. So this, this existing sanitary sewer only takes flow from the homes on this street here. That's all it's receiving. Is that more than one? Um, I forget how or many just homes. just the one. There's, there's homes along Jefferson Street okay. here. Yeah. And how about water and water pressure? We had some questions. I'm not sure what we've got for water pressure. Somebody mentioned 40 pounds a square foot. I guess what's the, A, what's the standard, and what are we going to have here once this is all done? Yes, I, I believe 40 pounds is the standard. It's the minimum, I believe, and that's set by MUD. They come in and they install their own water system. Um, I haven't seen their drawings, but just assuming by who has water service out there, if these homes here have water service and these homes up here have water service, then there's gotta be a line either connecting in here this way or coming down this way. And all they will do is just create a loop. So everybody has pressure. Seventy is kind of what the ideal, that's what most fixtures are designed for now. That's 70. what you want to aim for. If to answer you, Mr. Ackley, seventy is kind of the ideal. Too much, bad, too little, bad. So, yeah, no more than 80, minimum of 40. 40. And in terms of the outlots as they're designed, are those designed that will basically strip the trees there and then have grasses or lower spots where the water can fill up in a storm event and then drain down, or what's contemplated there? Again, you got outlot A shown north of the six houses up north, and you got another outlot A shown north of. <coughs> item seven through 10, and then there's another outlot A south of item six there. Yes, good question. So that's for storm drain, which is considered um, the post-construction uh, stormwater management plan. And that's the area that we have highlighted in gray here. That area is gonna be used to treat our half inch water quality. It's gonna be used to make sure we're not flooding or creating more runoff that's created by paving. Um, so it's gonna be designed to handle our storms two year, 10 year, and 100 year. Um, this area in gray, um, used for storm drain, it's also landscaped. So in order for us to treat our water, we have to use certain type of plants that, you know, um, with the root systems, they take in and break down the hydrocarbons. So that's, that's the intent of that area in gray. Outlaw A, it's too hilly to do anything with it. Can you speak up to the microphone, please? Outlaw A is, in this area here, is too hilly to do anything with it. So any trees in here are just going to remain. There's no reason for us to do anything there. Down on this side, same thing. We're just trying to connect grades in here. Um, if there's trees or something, that, that can stay there. There's, there's no reason why to take that out. Did I cover it all? Yeah, so question for staff. If developer creates uh, the 10 units and sells all 10 units, who's responsible for outlaw A once the sales are done? So, 
Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So this whole development is going to be put on private property. So the private developer is responsible for that. It's not public. So there'll be like a homeowners association or something where the yes. 10 lots would be responsible for all the outlot areas once it's done? Correctly. Okay. The common area is all shown as an outlot. So yes, that'll have to be maintained in perpetuity by an HOA. It won't be city maintained. I guess is, and this isn't a, an official plat here, but I guess when we get to that stage of the game, if we do, it seems like we'd have different names for different outlots because they'll probably have different uses or restrictions as to, <clears throat> instead of calling them all outlot A. It's all one large outlot. So they're not separate lots. But again, if there's going to be improvements made to some to handle the stormwater drainage, I would think that others would would have no restrictions on them versus the, the ones that I, have to They'd satisfy. probably have to separate them into two different outlots then, yeah, because um, right now it's just shown all as one. Well, I guess question for well, Mr. Willis, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add to that. I mean, there, even though it's one outlot, the it's designated with different easements so that that was the idea if, i mean if it needs to be split that's fine but there, but so you have the stormwater easement uh you know that's identified on part of that outlot so it was it was separated that way in, instead of having two outlots so as long as you're there mr Wallace. yeah yeah i guess i shouldn't have came up are you done with mr <laughs> yep yep thank you i guess let's walk through math i'm not the smartest guy yep. in the room but according to the plan, we've got $4 million of cost for this. I think I read in the paper we're going to sell 10 lots for 300000 each. I think tonight you mentioned we're going to sell them for three fifteen each. So the goal is, I mean, the goal is to hit right at that $300,000 mark. So we used three hundred fifteen in our TIF projections uh, for a couple of reasons. That's One, for the assessed value. That's the assessed value, yeah. Yep. So, you know, the goal, again, the goal would be to sell a unit for a about three hundred thousand. Um, we use three fifteen um, again, kind of for. Well, I guess I'd say three reasons. One is the just in case, you know, cushion. Everything's going up. I think cost rise. One is some of these. If if all of a sudden they want to dig out a basement or do something additional, and that's going to be you're going to hit you know low th you know below three on one and a little higher on one. So you know, averaging out. But again, the goal is right at that three hundred level. And without the Again, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in TIF, which you know roughly becomes seventy five thousand dollars a lot. That's that's kind of what you're what you're driving your costs at. And again, I guess that puts you close to four hundred thousand um, dollars. Is is basically how we were looking at that. Again, I'm not the smartest guy in the room for math, but if we've got four million dollars of costs, which I believe that's what we're contemplating here in the plan, right? And we sell 10 lots for 315,000 each. That gets us to 3,150. If we add 750,000 of TIF money, which will get paid over the course of 15 years, you're still not even hitting your costs. I guess, how is this project feasible? I assume somewhere there's probably profit built in as well, which I don't see a line for that. Well, you're okay. So you're seven. Well, part of this is your seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. I mean, that's present value, I guess. I mean, no, I don't. I'm not sure that answers your question. Um, I'm, I might, might uh, ask Jeff to to speak to this. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I that I think. What it what it does show is that it's not feasible without. But uh, I don't know where we had the, the four million. I for us it would hit around three million. So okay. So page three of the plan I guess talks about four million dollars of cost. Like four million, yeah. Okay. So if it's going to take three million well, to cost, part of that too to answer that Tom would be uh, when it comes to some of these are going to you're averaging. So some are going to come a little higher. We're going to finish the basement. And, you know that'll couple some of that. Um, but I don't anticipate, I think we just put that in there for inflationary purposes, but I, to be honest with you, I, I don't know that we'd go over three or 3.2. Well, and again, we're going to play with math here and I'll apologize, but if we had, and again, some will be a little higher, some a little lower, Correct. but if 3,150,000 would be what you could sell them for, 
And if 3 million to 3 million 150 is your cost, again, the 750 a TIF, is that all profit at that point? Or I guess what's the, what's the need for the TIF on the butt for? Because typically it's because you just can't get infrastructure in. I think as another example, just so you know where I'm going here, we had a uh, previous redevelopment plan and part of their basically projection showed that without TIF, it would be about break even at best. And with TIF, they would make maybe a 4%, 5% profit. Again, the TIF covered a certain amount of infrastructure that made the project feasible. Again, I'm just trying to understand the math here. I mean, I think the answer I was just confirming, we we're speaking on the same level here, but I think it's the $4 million, and again, that was just estimated maybe, but but that's without that seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I guess you'd, I guess we're, and, and we had three one fifty in there. So maybe we're, what are we off there? Ten thousand, some some number. Maybe I'm not the one who can't do math right now. But anyway, that's so it's it's the costs are three million plus, mm -hmm. assuming the TIF comes in. So it is, I, I believe, right? I mean that, that the four million is the is would be your cost without. That's and that that would be what you're that. getting at is, without TIF, we're talking about a four million dollar project. Which is the same with TIF. It's just that you have seven hundred fifty thousand dollars there to, to lower that cushion so that it is feasible. I understand, but you're still going to have a shortfall. In other words, we got about a hundred thousand dollar gap, and again, I assume there's got to be some profit motive here. We wouldn't probably do this at all. Well, and some of these are just the inflationary costs we've been seeing recently. It's really hard. every just as a home builder, we've been seeing just in the last four or five months, six months, we've seen 20, 30 percent increase. So some of these boys, we got started on this time, we got numbers inputted, and then some were projected and, and some are current. So by the time we get through the 18 months, you know, the three, the 315 is gonna have a different value, you know, if, if that's our average. One of the other things, I guess, going back and just as a moment in time for the year, and this is beyond the purview of planning. Ultimately, this is an economic decision for the city council. When I look at the TIF amount per unit on these, this would be the highest one that we have to go through, 750,000 for 10 units, would be 75 grand a unit, which is a pretty good chunk of um, public monies for development. If you look back previously, I think if we did the Hillcrest, that comes out to somewhere in the 37,000 or so per unit, 56 units. Uh, we did another one recently where there were 12 townhomes. Again, that's probably the smallest TIF we've ever done. That came up somewhere in the, uh, the high 50s, I think, for price per unit. Again, that's an economic decision, but as I look at the numbers, I just, I mean, the reason you need the TIF is because it is too expensive to develop, which is why that's been sitting there. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, based on what you're showing us here, to get a $315,000 house, I'm not sure the math still works. Well, I think that's and, the... And if ultimately you end up with a project that gets started and you're waiting for 15 years for the tax increment money to come in with the development, I'm not sure how sustainable this is from a, from a start to finish for you. Well, at least address the first, I mean, the first part, I mean, with. I don't know the other, I'm not sure about the other projects, but that's why this one, in part, I mean, we've, we've had multiple people talk about how difficult this site is. So I guess the question is, do you, do you, you know, I know the answer from behind is no, they don't ever want it developed. But if, if you want infill housing, I mean, this is, this is the opportunity to develop this. It's going to require a lot. Um, and yeah, so it ends up being $75,000 versus 40 per lot or whatever you were thinking of, whatever you had mentioned earlier. And that was probably just infrastructure on a, on a, I don't know, I'm not sure what those other projects are, so I can't speak to that. But again, that's the particular concern with this specific site is in order, it, it's it's going to take that much to develop and it ends up, yeah, it ends up being 75,000 a lot. So um, that's the, the particular challenge of this site, which is, which is why we're here. I guess a <clears throat> question for Tammy, and this will be an unfair question for you. I know, uh, and maybe for those of you that are builders, you can help, but when you build a new home, 
typically if you got 400,000 of cost, the assessed value is not going to be 400,000. It's going to be something less. It's based on price per square foot, not new construction costs. So again, if we're going to base all our projections on 315,000 per unit when it's all done, any estimate of cost-wise, what would an assessor, and I guess I throw this to anybody who's got experience with where the assessed values are compared to new construction. I mean, when you look at my house and others that are used houses, assessed value typically trails behind even a, a used house, even though we all don't like paying the taxes we do on the assessed value. Well, Mr. Ackley, that is an unfair question for me because I can't <coughs> speak to how the, I'm not an appraiser, I can't speak to how they appraise it. Maybe Mr. Hankins can help out in this situation, but he probably has more. The assessor will look at uh, recent sales, and there are no comparable sales of this type of property in Bellevue. So as an appraiser, I would have a hard time doing a market value of 300 or whatever they're looking for. Although they're, if I'm reading it right, the square footage of these units is probably bigger than the houses around them. Right. The ones that have the two stories. So again, on a price per square unit, it, for those of you that are thinking the blight and substandard lowers your value, I would suggest this development coming in should actually increase the value of your home because you'll have newer, larger houses next to you, potentially. Um, but again, I don't know how we, how much you're gonna end up putting into it. And as a, <clears throat> if I put my realtor hat on, I would have a hard time selling this to my clients the price that they're asking for but again it's not so I, I i guess i would and i i mean i guess i would say maybe that's you know build a risk now i understand that you're looking at this from <laughs> making sure it's feasible but um if these if it, the, you know as the way tax increment financing works if these our projection is based on three hundred fifteen thousand dollar average per per lot if it comes in lower that means there's less TIF coming back to developer. Um, that's the risk of the developer. Mm -hmm. So I get, I mean, uh, unless there's some worst case scenario where it doesn't get done, the risk is that, I mean, that there's less profit there, right? They're lo the, the developer's losing money. It doesn't change anything from the development standpoint. That's over the 15 year period, the repayment doesn't get paid back. So. I mean that's that's developer risk. That's that's part of the that's part of what's going on. So if we're if we've projected our our final values wrong, that that hurts that hurts you know only only this side of the microphone right now. Um, as far as and again as far as valuation goes, yes, I don't know. There's nothing comparable. I don't know what we have for comparable. Um, it's pres I mean again these are bigger newer. The idea is to create nicer, you know, nice quality units in this spot. It's it's that's that's what Jeff is trying to do. Maybe we disagree that that's a good idea from a from a business standpoint, but I guess that's why. I mean, he's he would disagree and say, well, it's worth it, worth the you know worth the try. So um, I mean, I think that's a different issue than. I mean, maybe maybe it's. Maybe it's not the type of housing, but again, I, you know, looking at the comp plan and the idea is that you need diverse housing in Old Town. And you don't want just single families that are the exact same size because that's what the comprehensive plan says. This creates different type of housing, different sizes, different models. Might not, maybe, maybe it's the wrong type and that's what you guys are coming at. But again, that's, the idea here is to create something different and, and, and do something a little different and take a little risk and, and, and change what, what's there. It, it may not work. I mean, I, I'll, I'll and with respect to the uh, square footage issue too, I, I get your point. I, I think we're still falling in the medium in that area. This, these aren't large, uh, you know, there's going to be one, two bedrooms up, up above and then a potential for two more on the lower level. <clears throat> so we're running 13 to 1500 square feet. I, I, I would, I would contend that they're not a larger uh, 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 property than what you would find in the, in the area. So we, we were ba basically when we did, the comparables we could see that these these would be maybe slightly more per square foot but it worked a lot better than if we were doing a home in there initially we were looking at two large three large homes and that would really vastly increase their property values so we we devaluated that one we didn't take a look at that approach the other approach is to do 
Well, should we then go look at 15, 16, 18, and we'll get an apartment, redevelop this for an apartment level? Well, we didn't think that would suit well and fit well in this. So from our standpoint, this is the best, I think, this suits this particular property the best, gives the best view based on the way we've set these and orientated these on the hill. So that's how we look at it. But I do not feel that these are a lot larger square footage than what we have currently. Sir, could I have you sign in? I don't oh, know yeah, that you, sure. thank you. Absolutely. <coughs> Commissioner Jacobson. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the uh, applicant. Uh, one of the uh, questions brought up in the public, and I'm looking for confirmation from your uh, construction design team, probably your engineer, who I'm sure you've stood up and signed in. But uh, yeah. if you would, is uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, do you have expertise in complying with that during construction and after construction to make sure that during the process of this project should it be approved that that your your group, your effort, will be able to comply with that? So I'm not an expert, but I only follow what the law allows us to do. And that lets us to cut trees outside the window of April 1st mm -hmm. to September 1st. Mm -hmm. So before April, um, we're, you know, we're allowed to cut trees um, or after September. Great, thank you. Yep. I guess, Madam Chair, a couple other comments. This is for the folks who came tonight oppose, again, every development we see in Bellevue, um, especially if it's on wooded land or vacant land around them, nobody wants to see the change. That's just a, a fact. We see that everywhere. Um, if you go to Willow Springs, which is on 25th and Cornhusker, the new addition across the road from that, Springbrook, what's the... Brook Park, Brookside. Brook Park, that's been 10 or 15 years. Everybody in the neighborhood shows up because we don't want to see anything but the field that's been across the street from us for all these years. Well, we that's exactly what a developer goes in and puts in new houses, and it's the same as where, where all of us live. At some point, it was it was empty or vacant, and we disturbed somebody else when we, when we went there. Um, for the gentleman who said that if, if we don't vote no on this, it means there's an agenda behind the surface, um, I take issue with that. I mean, the only folks that normally show up for our planning commission meetings are those that have an interest in what's happening in their neighborhood. And again, most often it's, geez, I don't want anything to change around me. You know, when CVS Pharmacy went in here about five years ago, uh, the place was packed with people who did not want CVS Pharmacy to go in on Pelton Avenue. If you poll your, everybody in the city of Bellevue and ask them, would you like CVS there? You're probably going to get 90% say, yeah, that's a great addition to the city. Again, we can't listen to just the voices that show up. We certainly do listen to you, and we want to hear your concerns. And to the extent we have water pressure issue, to the extent we have infrastructure issues, we want to get that figured out. You have brought up some points on traffic. Um, appreciate that is a high traffic area already. Adding 10 units to it from a planning perspective, you know, staff has looked at that, planning department's looked at that, and they're saying adding 10 units does not add so much that it's an issue. You can certainly bring concerns forward if we need to have a lighted uh, intersection there where Galvin meets Franklin. That's one possibility to slow traffic down. Um, but again, we do listen to you. We do hear you. But if we vote in favor of this, it doesn't mean that there's something going on under the surface. It means that you've got folks that are currently living somewhere that would prefer not to see anything change. And unfortunately, when things go through the Planning Commission, uh, normally it means change for those that are around them. We recently did a small development, if you know where DJ's dugout is on 25th and Cornhusker. Deep slope drops down to that. It's been a farmer's field forever. Nobody's developed it because it's hard to develop and it's got topography. I guess I would argue similar to this. It's hard to get to. Uh, we're to the point where land prices and infill development, somebody figured out how they could develop that and we have development going in. And the folks in Willow Springs who live next to that field, they came in and forced and said, don't put that there. We want to continue to look at the fields and we want to continue to look at the deer that are there. Well, again, it's a development that benefits the city. Ultimately, if we don't have new development coming to this city, um, as prices and costs go up for the city, we're all going to pay more taxes. 
unless we bring in new development to create new taxes, uh, there's no other way to continue supporting this unless we all just get the heck taxed out of us. And I'll leave it to all of you to talk to your assessor on how much we already feel we're maybe getting taxed. Um, but it's just going to get worse if we don't have new development coming in. So the question for us tonight is whether the new development is in the right place in this location. Again, as Mr. Arney mentioned, these have been platted lots forever. I think Ms. Palm, you mentioned 1965. Um, it's been platted. No one has ever gone to develop it because it is so hard to do. I guess the only question I have on it, and again, for the developer that's here, my main concern is whether this thing even works with tax increment financing for you. The numbers you proposed in your plan, to me, don't work, even with the TIF. And there would be nothing worse for you to, than, than to go through all of this and maybe get a construction loan and get started and discover you either can't finish it or it's not feasible. Then you're going to be in a worse shape than you are to start. Um, so that's my main concern is that the, uh, whether the numbers work even with the TIF. I got one other comment to make that <clears throat> I meant to address when I was speaking a little bit earlier on. I, I heard someone get up tonight and talk about blight and substandard and said, you know, once something's blighted, it's blighted forever. And that is very true with the way everything stands right now. But I, just for the record, I, and not just for you folks, for other people out there, I did want to let you guys know that there is a, there is a bill right now that's been drafted uh, by Senator Hunt that is in the legislation this year actually to take in, um, it strictly involves some blighting property. Um, and, and I hope they get that passed, you know. So then some of the stuff that we have done isn't, don't have that name attached to it forever. Um, in this world, things change. They change very rapidly. And like I said, that is in the legislation this year. and. I don't know where it's going, but at least somebody's looking at that, you know, that so maybe down the road, something that is blighted may not be blighted forever. Commissioners, your wishes. I guess question for the developer, Mr. Willis, or Mr. Gearing, again, I'm not convinced from the package that this thing works mathematically even with the TIF. And I would ask you the question, would you prefer that we would hold this over to get that figured out for a month here as to where we might have some information that isn't quite on point or that we need to get updated on or would you prefer that there be a vote tonight? Well, it, uh, as I understand it, the, 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 the larger $4 million is what you would do without the TIF. And those are all projected numbers. Um, based on what we've been able to, to determine for a full build-out, we can certainly look at that in the, in the low $3 million range. Um, again, there's some of these will sell for more than three. Now, keep in mind there's going to be inflation. We're discussing today's numbers. How is that going to be in 18 months from now? It's going to be hard to tell. I can't project that. Obviously, from what you've been seeing, and we all know, Tom, and uh, the rest of the commissioners, is that the, the prices that we've been seeing today have been have been escalating substantially. And so it's that we also have to keep in mind it's been difficult to put these numbers together and, and place them exactly where they need to be. But I will tell you wholeheartedly, I think these, these, these are going to be very attractive units sitting on a very beautiful piece of land up here. I know it's going to take quite a bit of it, – it is difficult to get real hard numbers on – as we all know, what this what this land is, and what we need to do for uh, site utilities, and we do have to move those utilities in order to make that work, as Fortino had outlined over here. So, um, but having said that, being a home builder, I do feel that we can easily keep the the costs in there, and I think we could make this work. Okay, thank you. There's no other comments. I make a motion. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion to approve based on the elimination of a blighted substandard area in conformance with the requirements of the state statute and the opportunity for infill development near Old Town District. Is there a second? 
Second by Jacobson. So we have a motion by Commissioner Arney, second by Commissioner Jacobson. Please vote. Seven voted yes, Mr. Ritz and Mr. Ackley voted no, motion carried. Ma'am, this is a public hearing. Okay, the next item, C3, request to rezone lots one through 10 and out lot A, Jefferson Place Edition, being a replat of lots one through six and part of lots seven through 11A, lying south and west of Harvell Drive, block 170 Bellevue, together with the adjacent vacated streets, avenues, and alleys from RD60 OTO to RG28 PS, with site plan approval for the purpose of multifamily residential development and small subdivision plat of lots one through 10 and outlot A, Jefferson Place Edition. Applicant, Mercury Property Management Incorporated, general location, 16th Avenue and Jefferson Street, case numbers 7-2110, Dash 21 and S dash 2110 26. The applicant, please come forward. First, if I might provide a couple of updates, please. Um, Certainly. As previously mentioned, we had the three uh, emails that were received after the packets went out. Again, that was uh, Ms. Jessica Conkey. She was at 1706 Franklin Street. Also, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Roger and Carol Shample Deasing, and then Diana Souza at 1702 Franklin Street, all expressing opposition to the development. I would again point those out that those have been made part of the record. Um, also wanted to point out a couple items from the staff report. First item um, on page one of the staff report under E requested actions. It says the request is from RD60 to RG28 PS. Um, while correct on the agenda, I have it wrong in the report. It should be RD60 OTO. There's an old town overlay. So just wanna make note of that. Also, there are were at the date of this report when it went out last Friday, there were still um, some technical deficiencies that needed to be addressed. There was uh, two dimensions on the small subdivision plat that needed to be verified by the surveyor. Those have been corrected and satisfied. Um, also, there was still some revisions that our city engineering staff were requesting to the preliminary grading um, and drainage plan. Those have also been satisfied as well. So um, just wanted to make note that those technical deficiencies have been satisfied by the applicant and his uh, team, his surveyor and his engineer. Okay. Now. Please come forward. Sorry, I've done that to you twice tonight. No so. <laughs> problem at all. Andrew Willis again. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about some of this in the previous hearing. I just, so very briefly again, the, the current zoning allows for duplexes and single family homes at minimum 6,000 square feet per lot per unit. So we're, you know, there is, you know, with 10 units on this lot, that's 7,500 square feet per lot right now. Again, it's, Odd shaped, um, some of those, you know, issue. We got some issues there, but again, size-wise, we're not trying to we're not trying to create additional density. The the, the change of zone really allows for that fourplex, and that's you know, it's, we're reshaping this and we're making it so we can develop uh, again what should be what should be compatible uh, with with the area and what exists. So that's you know, prim primary, you know, that allows for that that fourplex and that and that you know, building together. Uh, you know, changing because of the grade, because of the, the unique shape of the lot. I mean, again, the same with same with the uh, the plan subdivision. I'm, you know, we look at it's really not we're not we're not creating density. We're we're dealing with an odd shaped lot or an odd shaped site and uh, the necessity to 
to change it a little bit to make it work. Um, it still fits in again from a density standpoint. It still fits in with the adjacent you know neighborhoods again as it's allowed now. You could do single family and duplexes. Um, we're not trying to put a large multifamily apartment in there. Um, the reason we're looking at that planned subdivision is because of we need to you know deal with topography, deal with these issues that are unique to this site. Um, not trying to not trying to do an extreme change, just making this work. Um, so and again, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. But again, broadly speaking, that's that's the goal here. But still remain with with ten units and uh, on this spot. Okay, thank you. So I am going to open the public hearing. Is there anybody who wants to speak on this particular issue, the zoning and the platting? Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to close the public hearing and turn it over to the commissioners. Comments, commissioners, questions? Just <clears throat> um, want to point out Realistically, there's room right now for seven development properties. If they came in right now, there's seven plats that would meet conformance. We're changing that to 10. So we are adding three. For the record, we are making it a little bit more denser. Um, and that's, you know, let, as we've said, those little odd corner ones that, as the city has said, don't conform. So we are going from seven to 10, which is as I understand it required to make it worth the um, the construction. And I can understand that, but to state it for the record, I do wanna say that we are increasing density from what is already platted right now. I guess for myself, just to comment, again, the last vote we took, I know, was based on, I don't think the math works um, with regard to the zoning. Again, it makes sense that we're doing residential and residential. I got no issue with the development. There's other comments, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion uh, that we approve based on conformance with the zoning ordinance, subdivision regulations, and comprehensive plan as well as a lack of perceived negative impact on the surrounding area. And the deficiencies are, I don't have to put the deficiencies, right? That's all right. Okay, that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Arnie, second by Perrin. Please vote. Eight voted yes, Mr. Ritz voted no. Motion carried. Oh, and this also will go before the planning, or excuse me, the city council on December 21st for a public hearing. Okay, moving on to current business for a approval of the 2022 uniform review schedule. <clears throat> 